Hello and welcome to the Project Hope podcast for families and friends with a loved one in a group of high demand, high control. I am your host, Jennifer. A lot has changed since I first started this podcast, so I thought I'd add a little to the initial introductions and provide something that's more up to date. I work with survivors of coercive control one-to-one. I also consult with families and I offer education to the public around such topics. For the full scope of what I offer and also my credentials, you're welcome to check out my website, jennifer-french.com. I have a master's in the psychology of coercive control and as of August, 2024, I've been accepted into a PhD program called Psychology, Policy, and Law. And I'll have a specialty in either criminal behavior or forensic victimology. This will support the work that I currently do as an expert witness in cases involving coercive control. The Project Hope podcast has provided such an amazing opportunity for me to meet many wonderful people, survivors, experts, family members, and it's truly a pleasure to meet each one of these individuals you will hear from. This podcast will conclude with season two as I enter into my PhD program, but I have many other exciting things on the horizon, so please stay in touch and go to my website for any and all current events. Thanks to all of you who listen to Project Hope and care about this community. I want to introduce this episode with a trigger warning as I'm about to share some excerpts from an article that is written about Victoria's story. For the full article and details, please see the link in the podcast notes. The article is thorough and very well written, revealing a detailed account that we will not fully dive into here. I did think, however, that it would be helpful for you all as an audience to have the foundational elements of Tori's story. Victoria was raised in the Truth House Ministry Church located in Maryland. The pastor of this church is Dr. E.C. Fulcher Jr. So here it is, taken from the No Eden Elsewhere article, released on July 24th, 2020. So these are excerpts and quotes from that article. When Victoria was a minor, this pastor, 50 years her elder, began complimenting her appearance by telling her she was beautiful and sexy. He also began constantly texting her. Victoria estimates this grooming behavior went on for about two and a half years. The alleged physical sexual abuse started when Victoria was 14. Fulcher told Victoria that he wanted her to give him her virginity. According to Fulcher, giving your virginity to him was considered giving your first fruits to the man of God. Victoria says Fulcher sexually assaulted her at least 15 times over the course of three years. At the time, Victoria believed she was the only one being abused by Fulcher and was too afraid to speak out. Fulcher was the man of God, and no one was allowed to question him. Unfortunately, his culture of fear and domination allowed him to abuse others as well. Several of Victoria's family members are victims of Fulcher's. At least two are alleged to have been underage at the time of their abuse. Victoria suffered greatly at the hands of E.C. Fulcher's abuse. When he found out that she had been intimate with someone else, he told her that her love life was so messed up because she didn't keep her promise to give her virginity to him, which made her a liar. Victoria said this destroyed her mentally and emotionally. Miraculously, she was able to garner enough strength to distance herself from him as she approached the age of 18, putting a stop to the abuse. In the fall of 2019, when Victoria was 21, she disclosed to her mother what had happened to her. She then went to file a police report. A person very close to Victoria disclosed that she was abused by E.C. Fulcher Jr. for many years. 
I won't get into the details of her abuse here, as that is her story to tell for a different time. It is horrific. More victims started to come forward, including another close friend of Victoria's and several other women in the church, including a mother and daughter, as well as a victim who was underage when she alleged, was allegedly assaulted. Fulcher had even propositioned Victoria's uncle, who is gay. The truth was this. Fulcher was using his position as a man of God to indulge his deviant sexual appetites. Detective David Skika of the Harvard County Sheriff's Department was assigned to Victoria's case. A search warrant was executed for Truth House Ministry Church on 10 16 19. Fulcher's mobile phone was confiscated and a forensic audit was conducted. The author of No Eden Elsewhere article requested a copy of the police report, and in the article she shares the results of the forensic review of Fulcher's phones, cameras, and computers. It is eye opening to say the least. So, again, please reference the article in the podcast notes for more information. I also want to mention here that I met Victoria through Megan and Dom Benninger, who have a website called baptistaccountability.org. They've personally put together a database regarding reports of abuse within a church environment. If this resource could be of help to you or anyone you know, please use it. Megan and Dom will also be on the Project Hope podcast at some point in the new year. I am just so honored that Victoria decided to share the story of her healing journey, and through it, I believe that many of you will find real inspiration. I believe that one of the most powerful things about this interview is that through Tori's sharing, we really get to understand the courage it takes to speak out as a survivor of sexual abuse, but to also have the layer of spiritual abuse on top of that, along with the excruciating rejection and inability to get through to those on the inside of a group who are under extreme manipulation and coercion. Also, if anyone has any information that could help Victoria's case, please do contact me so I can put you in touch. It's heartbreaking to imagine that this is still happening, and we do know that this pastor is still running his church with business as usual at this time. With this particular episode, it's my personal hope that the Project Hope podcast is helping to get the word out there about this Truth House Ministry Church and E.C. Fulcher Jr. and get authorities back involved. So, Victoria... Tori, welcome. I'm so grateful to have you on the Project Hope podcast today. And I feel so grateful that you, and honored really, that you are open to sharing your story with us today. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to having the opportunity to kind of dive deeper into that. So I'm very excited. So, um, so I wondered if you would be open to just sharing with us a little bit about, um, so there is an incredible article that has been written about your story um, on noedenelsewhere.com, and we'll provide the link for our listeners uh, with that. But there, the article is called The Truth About Truth House Ministry Church and Dr. E.C. Fulcher, Jr., and I feel very happy to name the church, name the person, because this is one of those cases that is just, I mean, it's kind of shocking in certain ways in terms of legality. So those are some of kind of the questions that I have for you. Um, but would you mind just sharing with the audience kind of the general overview of what transpired for you at the Truth House Ministry? Yeah. Um, so it's 
a church that I grew up in ever since I was two. So um, it's kind of all I ever knew my whole life. Um, I looked at many people in that church, like um, mother figures, father figures, grandfathers, just like a whole family, really, because everybody was so tight knit. Yeah. Um, but I really looked up to the preacher the most, obviously, because he was the one that ran it. He was supposed to be um, the most important person in all of our lives. Um, he, he oftentimes would talk about how he should be like kind of the most important, um, leader in everybody's life in that church. Um, you know, his advice above everybody else's. So I really grew to trust him. Um, especially since my entire family also attended that church. So they all kind of held him to a high regard. So that was instilled in me. Um, so yeah, I think around the time that I actually hit puberty, things got a little interesting in that church. Um, he started out by making inappropriate comments. It turned into him calling me upstairs into, cause he had a private, private office inside the church, um, that he would always call me into, have me close the door. Um, and things got inappropriate. Um, and I didn't talk about them for a long time just cause, um, for a few reasons I thought, that it was normal because it's what I grew up in. So I just thought that it was okay. I thought that everyone kind of knew. Um, and I also didn't want to lose any of my family by speaking out against someone that they all, you know, cared so much about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And when that started, you were underage. Mm -hmm. And then if I uh, recall correctly from the article, then tell us a little bit about how you decide to, I think you were like 22-ish, and you decided to actually say something to your mother. Yeah, so it all started because um, I was dating someone at the time, um, and I was I was. I, Sorry, I was actually 21, not 22, um, when I decided to speak out. And uh, I was dating someone, and they were the first person that I told about the things that I had been experiencing or had experienced when I was underage by this man. And it was kind of a very, like, explosive big night for me because I, that's the first time I ever voiced it to anybody. I never told anyone. And I think me finally saying what happened made me realize that, you know, that's not okay. <laughs> and it was never okay, but... I think it took me actually saying it and seeing how they responded for me to realize that um, that shouldn't happen to anybody. Um, and then I remember it was a Friday night and we had church every Friday and Sunday and we were on the way to church. And that's when I kind of broke down and it was kind of, um, well, very, very emotional for me. I was very emotional. I kind of blew up and just, told my mom everything. I was like, I don't understand why we're doing all of this for a man who did all of these things to me when I was younger. Oh, wow. And, um, and she was, she didn't know what to say. I mean, the first time I told her, it was, she was kind of in shock because she didn't know that that had been going on or that it had affected me in the way that it did. Um, I kind of, I, I was kind of a troubled teenage child and looking back, you know, the older that I grow, I can see why I had like the mental, the depression, the issues that I did have and the way that I thought about myself, um, looked at relationships with people. I can see that a lot of, a lot of that was affected and instilled in me because of the things that he had done to me and said to me, um, in my early teens, you know, yeah, when I was developing. Yes. Yes. So how, Interesting. So you actually were waking up on your own to really question why are we continuing to do this and continuing to um, attend and even kind of put this man on a pedestal? Yeah, he had done um, a few really questionable things. I can think of two big events that took place that had nothing to do with the things that he did to me but things that he stood for in the church and said that made me really lose respect for him. And that's 
when I started questioning him, I was around 18 when things, these things started occurring. Um, and that's when I really started, you know, checking out of the church and not just going with the flow because in those cult settings, it's so easy just to, when you're in it for so long, just say, okay, this is how it's supposed to be. Right. But certain things started happening and it made me start, you know, questioning him, which nobody was doing in that church. Everybody just says, okay. And, you know, marches, but, um, yeah. And so then you ended up actually your mother, um, supported you and helped you and you guys actually filed a police report. Yeah. So, um, that did happen. We, we initially just wanted to start, um, an investigation, um, to see if there was anything there because Maryland is really, really strange with their child laws. Um, they don't really care much about, you know, what I know happened or what I said. It's kind of like, if there's no proof, then we we don't really care. It doesn't matter, you know, how, cause even the detective said, we know there's something wrong with this man. He's sick. He should be locked up. But looking back at the police report and all the weird things they found, a lot of people feel like they should have kept going or done more. Um, but yeah, initially we wanted to start just an investigation to see, you know, has this happened to other people? Is there anything that we can find? Because most, most of the proof was in the text messages that he had um, written to me when I was underage. Um, and we just wanted some kind of subpoena or something. And we, we're still looking into that to try to retrieve those. Um, Cause that would, that would be it. <laughs> That's all we need. But um, he had deleted the messages on his phone when they had, you know, took all of his devices and raided the church. Um, and I didn't have those texts. A very common trend you will see with the women that he has abused is that he would always tell them, make sure you're deleting your text. He used to say this to me all the time when I was like 15 or 16. He would say something and then he would say, I hope you're deleting your text. I hope this stays just between us. Um, and me just, I just wanted to be obedient because he would always talk about in church, you know, you better not lie to me. If you lie to me, you're basically going to hell. He would say, um, so me just wanting to be obedient and, you know, not go to hell. I was like, all right, I'm gonna delete my messages then because, um, you kind of just, um, want to follow the rules, but yeah. So we launched that investigation and I think it it's closed for now, but the more people look at it, the more people are thinking that we should reopen it. Well, and I think that's, you know, where I kind of came, stepped away from that going, this is absolutely insane that something can't be done um, or that something can't be done with even what they already have in regards to his phone. But I suppose the other items that they found, which for the listeners, you're welcome to look at this article and you will see actually all of the police or at least what I think is all of the police documentation and the reports that have been done and the findings and they're shocking. I mean, it's really obvious that he is not who he says he is. Um, and I'll leave it at that for now, but, um, But that was a big question that I had for you, Tori, is it's so hard to understand that, I mean, is he actually still functioning? He is. Everything is back to normal. Um, uh, The only people that left with me were my, initially my mom and stepdad were the ones that were like, this is messed up. And he had also done things to other family members. So that's another reason my stepdad just would not stand for that in that church anymore. Yeah. So initially they left. Um, then my grandmother and my two uncles left after. Actually, no. My my grandmother and my two uncles were kicked out because they kept talking to us after we left. Mm. Um. So yeah, but they're still they're still functioning. Everything is pretty much back to normal, which is crazy. And do other people in the congregation have they been told or no? Uh, so the funny thing is we, we don't really know because, um, you know, when in that church, the rules are, if you leave, nobody in that church is allowed to talk to you. So in retrospect, it makes sense because some of the women that have left in the past and families that have left in the past, we didn't know the truth about why they left because we weren't allowed to talk to them. Yeah. And when we left, 
the pastor had an issue with people still talking to us and just looking back at it, it's like, clearly he doesn't want the people to know the truth about what really happened. He wants to tell his own story because that's what he was doing. Cause we, we did keep in contact with my grandma when she was in there and he was telling the story completely different. Like we were making up these crazy lies. Um, in the, in the beginning when we left, he was very repentful and sorry. And he said that he hopes that we can come back, that he did make a few mistakes, but I think he grew angry, angrier and angrier as time went on. Um, and then he just had people shun us, told his own story. And now we don't know what else, what else he's telling people, but hopefully they'll, they will hear this podcast and kind of, um, you know, know some of the truth if they don't already know. Yes. And Tori, that is our hope. And it is just, you know, we will definitely put the name of the church, the name of the individual on this. And it is my hope. I mean, it is, it's so powerful the way um, organizations function like this, you know, when it, when it has this kind of powerful, um, especially with spiritual abuse, you know, it has such a powerful way to manipulate and keep everybody believing certain yeah. things. Yeah. And it keeps people very scared and in bondage because they think if they think any other way or, you know, speak the truth on a subject that they can just in- endure the abuse because of that, you know, they'll go to hell if they say anything. And that's what he really uses to his power is if you say anything against him, you basically are going to hell, you know? Yeah. So that's why a lot of people are scared to, you know, say any type of truth or look at things in a different light because they've just been so conditioned. And it's sad. Absolutely. And all the more amazing that you have come out and spoken out about this because for people to really understand what it takes to do that, especially when you know in speaking out you understand what the rejection is going to be yeah. and the complete cut off and cut out of the community and the repercussions sure. of the family and all of that. Yeah. Um, that's honestly one of the biggest reasons I didn't want to say anything initially was because when I came out with this story, I was ready to lose even my mom and my stepdad, which are basically like, you know, my stepdad is basically like my real dad. He raised me. So I was ready to, you know, lose everyone. Um, so it's a real blessing that they had stood by me and been so supportive. Um, I also did lose my real dad and my stepmom and, you know, my baby brother, who I think was three or four at the time when I left. I haven't seen him since, which has been hard. Yeah. But I feel like um, it's a sacrifice that you have to make in order to start bringing light to things. And I just hope that it ripples and that I do get to see them again one day. Yes. Oh my gosh. I so hope that that happens for you, Tori. And I really just, it's, you are amazing (laughs) what you've, what you've done and what you've chosen. That's really awesome. Um, So tell me also about, um, tell me a little bit about your mom and your stepdad and kind of how this has affected them. Have you guys, and also I'm curious about um, kind of your friend unit as well. Um, But let's, uh, in terms of your mom and your stepdad, were they also stepping away from family and friends? While they were in the church? No, in, in knowing that they were supporting you. Did that, oh, yeah. they know that that meant, did they lose friends and, and family? I am delighted to offer you Pure Haven products. All proceeds received go right back to the Project Hope podcast. I myself have been using these pure, safe, and toxin-free products for over four years, and I absolutely love knowing that my home has countertops that my little niece and nephew can eat off of without worrying that they have a handful of chemicals being placed in their mouths. 
the cleaning products are some of my favorites. Uh, the glass and surface cleaners smell amazing as well. So if this is of interest to you, please go to purehaven.com slash Jennifer French. The link is also included below with information about this podcast segment. So my mom, um, I'm so happy that she, um, my grandma left with us because I know she would have really been a mess if my grandma didn't listen to us. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that that's good on that part. But my stepdad, um, his whole family, my stepdad basically was born in the church. So he mm-hmm. has his mom, his dad, um, and uh, three sisters that are still in the church that have all shunned him. Um, and they went so far because obviously that's heartbreaking to anybody. If your whole family, I can't imagine I have told everybody, you know, I feel the worst for my stepdad because he lost everyone. I have my mom, you know, my mom has her mom, but my stepdad doesn't have anyone. They're all, I mean, he has us of course, but your mom, your dad, your sisters, everybody that you grew up with your whole life, that they're still like defending this man tooth and bone. Mm. And, um, they actually went so far because, you know, my, my stepdad did want to try to keep reaching out to his mother. He missed her. He loves her more than anything. Um, they, they tried to put a restraining order on him, telling him that he was a threat and made up a bunch of ridiculous lies in court just so that he would stop reaching out to them and trying to have a relationship with them. Yeah. Some crazy, crazy lies, crazy lies. Um, and it's just, it just goes to show what people will do to, you know, defend this man, um, you know, no matter what. It but, is amazing. I mean, this, again, it's so classic cultic behavior and mm-hmm. just the spiritual abuse and indoctrination is powerful. Yeah. And um, I remember I went to court with my stepdad for, you know, when they were trying to do this restraining order against him. And I just looked across the room at one of his sisters and she just started laughing at me in the middle, middle of the courtroom when we were all just sitting there worried about, you know, my, my stepdad runs a whole business. He's a businessman. He, why would he want this on his record? We were all worried. And she just looked over and started laughing. And I was like, some of those people are really, you know, they need help. They're really sick and it's sad. It's really sad. Um, mm-hmm. But right, and they have bought into certain lies that they're functioning from. Yeah, and that also shows that that you know um, they're probably not being told the complete truth. Um, I com- I really really doubt it because I think at least a few more of those people, or at least women, um, a few more would have left if they knew. Um, yes, and so often with these types of cases, I mean, there's other abuse happening. And so when one person kind of blows the lid off of it, typically other people also start to go, oh, wait a second, something funny happened here or here or here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, oh, it's, you, it's funny you said that because um, I remember when this whole thing blew up, I actually told my real dad, um, who was very, very faithful to the church and still is. Um, and I remember one night when everything blew up, when the investigation launched and when they raided the church, he called me and he said, what is happening? And I I told him everything. I told him the truth. I told him everything that had happened to me in detail. And he said, and I said, you don't have to believe me. This is just the truth. I understand if you don't, because I know the mindset of those people. I can't be mad at them because I was also in that mindset too for, you know, 20 years where I would defend this man tooth and nail. Yeah. Um, but he said, he said to me, you know, this man is disgusting. This man is a pig. Like you don't deserve that. I don't care that this didn't happen, even though, you know, the worst case scenario didn't happen. A lot of things still did happen. And he said, you don't deserve that. Nobody should go through that. Yeah. And then he said that my stepmom had suffered, been suffering many years for kind of the same thing that I had experienced. And he said, he told me that night to that, to that day, to this day, she is still suffering and still has trauma. And um, a few weeks later, he told me that she wanted to talk to me, but I think she was scared and she, she never did. I remember I came over their house one time after that happened oh. and 
I was sitting in the living room with my stepmom and um, she was just being very quiet. And I said, is everything okay? Like, I know I, I'm not going to this church anymore, but I'm still me. I'm still the same. You can talk to me because we got pretty close. Yeah. Um, and she said, she said, I just feel like a traitor for having you here. You know, a traitor to the church. Wow. So she, she never ended up telling me what happened, but I'm, I have a pretty good idea from just the way my, my real dad talked about it. Oh, heartbreaking. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And so um, tell us, Tori, have you had a pretty good support system? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, it was definitely really hard um, when it initially happened. You know, I, I was so grateful that I did have my mom and my stepdad and yes. my grandmother. I don't know what I would do if the worst had happened and nobody believed me and I just left. I probably would have needed a lot more therapy, (laughs) but, um, I've had amazing people here and everybody that I've told about it has been so supportive. You can even see in like the comments of that article, some of my friends have came forward and told their stories and, you know, knowing me and me telling them my story. It's, it's really nice to see that there are people that will believe me because when you're in that position, you you think nobody will. And I think that's why nobody comes forward is because they think, you know, nobody will take your word for it. But, um, a year later and I feel a lot better, you know, more free. It feels really good to be in this position and have my story out there instead of, you know, sometimes it's funny to think like what would have happened if I stayed and I'm so happy that I didn't. Um, I think it was worse, you know, the pain that I went through and I like, and I'm so grateful that you're having me on this podcast, you know, because I, I do want to keep getting this story out there and not only helping people in that church, but more people that have went through this in general in other churches, other different positions, you know, give them that courage to speak out. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think when it comes to spiritual abuse, for me personally, it is a topic that just is so devastating because it takes what's beautiful And it takes also the goodness in people Mm. and does something twisted with it. I think it's such a horrible, horrible form of abuse because it just really messes with every aspect of your life. And um, especially when it's church abuse mixed with a cult. So you really can't, you know, talk to anybody in that church and you're so scared to speak out. Um, And the way that people still defend that man is just crazy and ludicrous. yeah, it's affected everybody, every single member of my family that has left. Um, but we're getting better with time. And I think people need to know that as well. Like, it's, I feel like it's definitely going to be hard in the beginning, but it does get better. Granted, we probably all need more, <laughs> more therapy because it's just so hard being in that for 20 years. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a really terrible form of abuse um, because it, that's supposed to be like, the peace in your life, the centerfold, you know, and for me, it kind of did mess me up, not only mentally, but um, it makes me wonder about religion and if all religion is this way and as, you know, perverted as this man made it to me. So I think a lot of people who have a similar experience question the same exact thing. So again, Tori, like, thank you so much for, sharing this story. I know it's going to resonate with so many people and inspire people. And it's just amazing what you've been through and where you're at now. So tell us a little bit. It sounds like you have a job. Yeah. Um, I got, um, you know, I'm working on my bachelor's now in information information technology. Nice. I have um, a job in the tech field out here. Oh yeah. I moved to California. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I moved from Maryland to California with my good friend um, back in July and it's been amazing. Nice. Um, everything has been really, really good and healthy and I'm healing and I'm actually, I am coming back around to the thought of religion um, for the longest. I didn't even want to hear about it. You know, yeah. I didn't want to talk about it, but I know that I'm healing because I'm open to the thought. Um, Yeah, and everything has been really good. 
Yeah. And, and also for you, I think it's so important for people to do healing in the way that's right for them. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you do just have to reject Mm -hmm. and then kind of come back to putting together what really makes sense for you, what really feels right to you. Yeah. And I think also moving away from that environment, because it was a small town um, where that church was and kind of being able to move away from that has been very healing for me as well, because it's just given me the opportunity to make, you know, new memories and see new spaces. And that's also been very healing. I know my parents are planning on moving as well in the near future, hopefully to California, fingers crossed. fabulous. (laughs) Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, but I know that'll be really good for all of them too. I think that'll be the final thing and they'll, you know, be more healed and everything will be better for everyone. Yeah. And that too, like, again, just being a proponent for everybody kind of healing in their own way. I've actually spoken to people, um, actually a gentleman who left a cultic environment. Um, I remember him saying, I forget the way he put it. It was really kind of funny that he, after that experience, he traveled a lot and Mm -hmm. lived in a number of different cities for a while. And he said that that was such a huge part of his healing you know, and I think for other people, it's probably, you know, that they would make different choices. But I thought that that was really interesting. Oh, yeah. I, that's so funny that you say that. I told my mom, I was like, I'm going to live in California for a few years and I'm going to go to New York because you kind of just feel so free and liberated because um, you were so tied down for so long. I could imagine why people would feel that way, that they just want to live in different cities, see the world. But I fell in love with California. I'm probably going to be here for a long time, Yay, but definitely travel. Definitely travel. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. California is amazing. <laughs> I, I went from New York to California. So, Oh, wow. I was thinking of going from California to New York, but I don't know what brought you here from New York. Actually work primarily, but really the need for a change. Yeah. I needed a big change and I was just ready. And so I put my resume out there and, you know, was, sort of exploring some different options. And I have family here as well. And so that was one of the reasons for this choice was family. So it really has been amazing. It's beautiful here. It is. And I say to people, you know, it's interesting for me living so close to the ocean. I can really say that there's something about that that has actually changed me. I can see that. Um, we we live like um, 45 minutes or so from, from the ocean. And I wasn't really much of a beach person until I got to the beaches around here. They're really different from other beaches. They're so relaxing. Yes. And it feels so good. Um, I really just live by the beaches on the weekend and um, relax. And it's very therapeutic. It sure. really is. And I, I always say, like, I think there's something about – standing in front of the expansiveness of the ocean. <laughs> yes. And, and it makes you feel small. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like it makes your problems feel a little bit smaller seeing such a big ocean and how big everything is. Exactly. That's how I see it. Perspective, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I think for me also, there's been this element, um, like my uh, fiance and I joke about how even just like touching my feet into the ocean feels like it kind of washes stuff away when I need that. Yes. Yes. It just, yeah. When I have, you know, bad days, bad nights, I definitely find myself um, taking little trips to the ocean and just sitting there. And I always feel better. Yeah. It's such a great way to heal. It is. Tori, thank you so much. I really am so grateful to you for your courage and really also for sharing your story, for continuing to be willing to, to step out in this way. No, thank you so much for having me. Um, after doing the article, I really wanted to, you know, keep it going, keep finding ways to get, you know, to get my story out there. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. Thank you. As I reflect further on my conversation with Tori, 
I'm struck that she and her family are now in the same dynamic that parents and friends experience when a loved one is in an extreme group. Victoria carries the burden of being abused, speaking out, but speaking out into an environment where nothing can stick because of the group mind and control that the leader has over that congregation. I may be repeating things you've already heard, but please let those little or big red flags be something we each one pay attention to in all areas of our lives. I can say that for myself, my intuition has become my North Star. It helps to guide my decisions and responses. I would even say that I relate to this part of myself as spiritual, allowing myself to be both silent and open to the still small voice within. But some of the obvious big red flags include a different kind of silencing. When there's a culture where you can't speak to people who leave, It's a huge red flag. When you leave or question, if you're presented with a spoken or unspoken consequence that you're going to hell or there will be repercussions of punishment, that's a huge red flag. That's called manipulation and falls into the unhealthy, damaging category of coercive control. But back to Victoria. Imagine the courage it takes to be willing to lose everything, all family and the reality you've known, the mindset and your paradigm of the world, the courage it would take to face knowing that you will be completely alone in rebuilding yourself. That is tremendous. I hold this reality that this courage exists in all of us, your person too. I didn't know Victoria prior to this interview, and I have thought of her many times since as a beacon of hope. What a beautiful process Victoria describes of claiming her healing journey. She experienced all the emotions one might, and she has consciously decided to not let it ruin her life. I'm not saying that that is easy. I'm not saying that's something everyone feels they have control over. But what I can say is that Victoria's story is absolutely one of hope. She has taken back her life, made her own decisions, made a huge move that's been really positive, and gives herself space to live and move and have her being. It's meeting people like Victoria, like all of you who I've interviewed, that make this podcast a complete honor for me to host that I get to receive such experiences, and then we can hope that they bring some value to others. We decided to move the release of this podcast up to December 30th in order to get out the word, get out the information. We typically release the Project Hope podcast episodes on the first or third week of each month. But when I saw this date, and thought of adding it on a Wednesday we don't release, it struck me that it was between Christmas and the new year, and to me at least, this feels significant. I asked Victoria if that date felt okay. She said yes, so I hope you've enjoyed it. Victoria, you are an inspiration to me, and I have the feeling that this will be the case for many others. May your open heart and bravery help to save the lives and spirits of many other women and families. I also want to acknowledge the roles of incredible courage from Victoria's mom, stepdad, and grandmother. May you each be blessed for deciding to listen and love. And may the love of this Christmas season and the energies of the Christmas star shine truth that supports all that is good. Again, please feel free to contact me if there are any ways we can help to expose Victoria's story and ensure no further harm is done to anyone at Truth House Ministry Church. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Project Hope podcast. 
If you enjoyed it, please feel free to subscribe and comment. You can always get in touch with me at jennifer-french.com. And please let me know any specific topics of interest. And of course, I'm always interested in your stories, whether you've left an organization of high demand, high control, or if you're an individual struggling with the knowing that someone you love is in such a situation. I am here for you. Think critically, take heart, and be free. <laughs>